typically in order for a fire to start or an explosion to occur we need to have three things well one we'll need an oxidizer which typically will be oxygen no we'll just call it oxygen uh, we'll need a fuel that we'll definitely need without the fuel it won't burn uh, and then usually we will need an ignition source there are some certain instances where this won't be necessary but for the most part we will also need an ignition source okay uh, so I want to go each well, one by one and, and discuss how important they are and how to calculate the minimum amount uh, of each uh, required to create an explosion or uh, combustion so let's look at the oxidizer first okay so for a fire to start or an explosion to occur we need some oxygen so oxygen must be present at a minimum value okay and we're going to call this minimum value the MOC or the minimum oxygen content okay well the MOC for minimum oxygen content okay and in order for us to determine this this is pretty simple it's going to be equal to the mass of oxygen divided by the uh, the mass of the mixture in which uh, we want we want to see uh, a combustion or an explosion so uh, this will include the rest of air obviously so if I if I am trying to burn up methanol or something like that right uh, I need to have the amount of methanol that I'm trying to burn as well as the amount of air that I'm trying to burn in the denominator and the minimum amount of, of oxygen in the numerator and I can I can determine this so this will give me a fraction and I can multiply that by a hundred if I want to get a percent uh, whatever whatever it is okay so uh, let's try to see how this applies and this is strictly from gen chem a uh, stoichiometry problem let's calculate the MOC okay uh, when propane uh, burns for propane combustion which you know uh, that occurs in your kitchen uh, hopefully daily okay so uh, let's say uh, we want to have 10 grams of propane so we'll have that uh, as, as a given so uh, we want to calculate the MOC um, uh, and the minimum amount of air required to fully burn 10 grams of propane so I also want to do the minimum amount of air because that's more practical because I don't have oxygen freely flowing around okay so I'll remind you propane uh, will combust and I'll I will I will balance the equation for us uh, this way so it's a fairly simple question because you can just apply principles from Gen Chem uh, and get this this is nothing nothing too involved okay so if I know I have 10 grams of propane I can use stoichiometry to get everything I need so uh, I know 10 grams of propane well I can convert this to moles of propane using the molecular weight right uh, and the molecular weight for propane is about 44 grams which is, you know close enough then uh, I see from my stoichiometry that I, I have 1.5 moles of O2 for every one mole of propane this way uh, and then uh, I know that uh, oxygen is 32 grams per mole its molecular weight and that way everything cancels except for grams of oxygen and I get uh, you know uh, 10.9 grams of O2 okay so we get that so that is uh, the minimum amount of oxygen required to burn uh, propane for 10 grams of propane that will be the my minimum amount mass per mass okay to uh, calculate the actual MOC I will need the amount of air so to calculate the minimum amount of air required uh, well we need to know the uh, how much oxygen is present in air so to calculate uh, minimum amount uh, of air 
we are just going to divide by the uh, percent of oxygen in the air by mass, right? Uh, we remember that uh, oxygen, that oxygen is 23.3% of air by mass. If you uh, don't believe me, you can calculate that, figure this out. Uh, we, we already know by mole, by volume, it's 21%. We rarely see it by mass, but it is 23.3% by mass, approximately assuming it's a binary mixture of nitrogen and oxygen. Uh, and therefore, whoops, 10.9 uh, grams of oxygen divided by 23.3%, I get that I need 46.8 grams of air to burn propane. That's the minimum per mass. If I have 10 grams of propane, I need about 46.8 grams of air to burn that. Okay? And now, lastly, we can calculate the MOC quite simply. MOC again will be the mass of oxygen uh, divided by the mass of the mixture that we're trying to burn. So it's going to be the mass of air plus the mass of the stuff, the, the, the fuel source itself, which is going to be here, propane. Uh, with, and we have everything, so this is 10.9 grams. Uh, this is going to be 46.8 grams. And this is going to be 10 grams. And we get that uh, this is 0.19 uh, or 19%. So this is my MOC, my minimum oxygen content required to burn propane. Okay, so that's that's it for t talking about the the oxidizer or the uh, the oxygen. Typically, will be oxygen. Uh, let's let's switch around a little bit and see what happens uh, from the point of view of the of the fuel source. So the way we talk about that for a fire to start, the concentration uh, so concentration of the fuel. Let's call that X. Uh, it has to reside between uh, two values. Between what I will call the lower flammability limit and the upper flammability limit. So X will reside between LFL and the UFL. Okay, so lower flammability limit, upper flammability limit. I'm just not writing it. Uh, so this will have to be true for this to occur. And uh, in a few minutes, I will show you how to calculate LFL and UFL uh, for a variety of, of different conditions. But basically, this is, this is going to give you a mole fraction of, uh, of your fuel source, uh, both of these. So if the mole fraction of your fuel resides between the lower level and the upper level, uh, you can actually burn the fuel. If it's below this level, that means there's not enough fuel to burn. If it's above this level, there's too much fuel to burn. What does this mean? This sounds a little counterintuitive. If I'm above a certain value, uh, I'm asserting that I'm not going to be able to burn my fuel. So if I have too much methane, I'm saying, I won't be able to burn it. How is that possible? Well, imagine I have 100% uh, methane uh, somewhere and I want to burn that. Uh, well, I won't be able to burn it if there's no oxygen, right? Because I need some oxygen for the combustion uh, reaction to occur. So if the, if the amount of oxygen is too low, uh, then it's not going to happen. So uh, that, at that point, from the point of view of oxygen, I haven't, I haven't reached the minimum oxygen content. So uh, again, I'm, we're just switching the point of view of, 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 of this. All right. Uh, and lastly, this is, so this was the concentration. This is the fuel itself. And as far as uh, the ignition source is concerned, I'll do a little aside here. Uh, this could be any sort of thing like a spark, uh, an open flame. Maybe it's a heated surface. Maybe some static, oops, heated surface. Maybe some static electricity, uh, you know, stuff like that. Uh, and there is a temperature. I will note this: there exists a temperature uh, 
uh, and it's known as the auto ignition temperature uh, whereby uh, <coughs> the fuel mixture if it's between LFL and UFL will burn without a source that's the, that's the auto ignition temperature so if you look at uh, MSDS's that you're getting from uh, from suppliers you will see oftentimes well, I think they require to they will tell you the auto ignition temperature for a specific compound and what that would mean is that try not to keep that uh, between LFL and UFL because it might auto ignite or try to uh, cool down the temperature of storage so that you won't uh, reach uh, auto ignition which is not which is not nice okay so let's go back to the LFL and the UFL so again these are just mole fractions so I think of them as mole fractions and it's going to be uh, using the terminology we've used before Y not X because it's going to be in the vapor stage so the mole fraction in vapor of your of your fuel that's that's how we calculate this uh, this is what it spits out at us when we calculate it that's what the meaning of this is okay uh, and uh, the these will depend on a variety of factors so first of all I will you know that for a, a, a bunch of pure substances you can go and look it up uh, you, you can go OSHA will have a, a tables for this uh, you can find them in a variety of places uh, you know uh, the EPA may have some you can find them in a variety of resources uh, what what the lower flammability limit and often also the upper flammability limit for a variety of, of pure substances and uh, when they usually give them to you it's at uh, standard condition so usually these are tabulated Uh, at standard conditions, you know, like uh, room temperature, room pressure, that kind of stuff. Okay, but uh, oftentimes when you you're carrying out design uh, design elements and things like that, you want to know what the what the lower flammability limit might be at a different temperature or pressure. So I will say that they they are functions of temperature and pressure. So the temperature will affect the value of the LFL and the UFL. So let me give you some empirical correlations that uh, show you how to handle this. So the if I know the LFL at a temperature 1 and I want to get it at a temperature 2, the LFL at temperature 2 will be equal to my LFL uh, at temperature 1, which will typically be 25 degrees Celsius, times uh, this factor. Uh, it will be 1 minus 3 quarters times uh, the delta T, T2 minus T1, uh, divided by the enthalpy of combustion uh, at T1 and uh, I will just make a note uh, that for this equation to take place to a uh, to be meaningful this enthalpy of combustion must be in units of kilocal per mole okay and typically these things this is as you know from pchem tables and things like that and you see it in genchem textbooks and pchem textbooks uh, you can go find it online the variety, like the CRC has that uh, the uh, this is typically tabulated at 25 degrees Celsius so uh, it's easy to choose 25 degrees Celsius as your uh, as your reference point for this okay uh, same thing occurs for the UFL I can change the L to U and it will still work so uh, just for completion's sake, I could do UFL at T2 is equal to UFL at T1 times the same factor, 1 minus 0.75 times delta T divided by the delta H of combustion at T1. So it's the same thing, you're just changing the L to a U. So you could do that for temperature, uh, and that's how, uh, if you need to, you can calculate the flammability, flammability limits at different uh, temperatures. What about pressure? Well, first of all, I will I will note that LFL is not a function of pressure. Okay, it just happens to be a very weak function of pressure, so don't worry about that. But the upper flammability limit will depend on pressure, and if I want to calculate that at a, at a, at a higher pressure or a lower pressure, P2, uh, I will calculate that based on the you know, initial 
uh, pressure, which again, typically you should choose standard conditions, which would be one ATM, uh, plus 20.6 times the log base 10 of P2 plus one, like that. And uh, the pressure here for this to work, this should be in megapascals. Okay, this, this, how it would work. Uh, that's why these numbers, the, the 20.6 thing, would work with that, uh, with that unit. Yeah, I mean, we can change it up if we want to do a different unit, but we'd have to just change up what this 20.6 would be, I, I, I presume, okay? So that's the pressure variation. Uh, the other thing that's uh, far, far more important, I think, than, than either one of these is uh, the fact that uh, you will rarely deal with just pure substances when, when trying to calculate the flammability limits. Uh, you will often use mixtures, and uh, you cannot find tabulations of mixtures flammability limits, and you will need to calculate that on, on your own. And to calculate uh, the flammability limit for a mixture, you just need to know the mixtures, the mixtures composition. So let's look at the compositional effects this way. The LFL for a mixture, uh, and again, this is going to be very similar to the upper flammability limit. Well, it's going to be exactly the same. Uh, it's going to be one over the sum of the mole fraction of each of the each of the components divided by. Uh, the LFL for each of the components. So like I mentioned, the LFL is tabulated for every pure, for most pure substances. And if you know the composition of that pure substance in your mixture, you can easily calculate the LFL for the mixture. Okay, so uh, that's how that would work. So you can just add them up and take the average. This is how you would do that. And the upper flammability limit for a mixture, same exact type thing, except I'm changing the L to a U. So it will be the sum for all components of y, of y divided by the upper flammability limit. So I will show you in a minute how to use these two relations. Okay? I think that using this is pretty straightforward. Uh, I mean, this is pretty straightforward too, but uh, it will involve some, uh, uh, some other relations depending on the mixture, if we're assuming it's an ideal mixture and things like that. So uh, we'll do a little review of thermodynamics and trying to figure, figure this out. Okay, so now that we are equipped with what the MOC is, what the LFL is, let's see when this actually matters. So I will, let's talk about this thing called the flash point. Uh, here's the pop. The flash point. Okay. And uh, we'll say flamm flammable liquids will not burn in air unless enough of the fume is vaporized. Okay, so I'm going to have a liquid uh, somewhere, and I'm saying that the the air around the liquid itself won't burn unless enough of that liquid will vaporize. Okay, so the temperature at which uh, the temperature at which enough Flammable liquid vaporizes, meaning that it exceeds the lower flammability limit, is known as the flash point. And again, I'll remind you that um, the LFL is just uh, another, LFL is basically a mole fraction. LFLI is mole fraction of YI, which is the pressure, the partial pressure for for, uh, for a component I. So it would look like this, okay? So I can assert that uh, when this lower flammability limit exceeds the vapor pressure, then enough vapor has vaporized over the liquid. Does that make sense? So if I look at it like this, the if the LFL for a mixture or for a pure substance or whatever exceeds the vapor pressure, partial pressure, I will have uh, reached 
my Flashpoint. Now, why is that? I will remind you in case you're confused. The PSAT, which is the va uh, vapor pressure, same thing. P vape. You can call it whatever I want. P vape, PSAT, same thing. Uh, the vapor pressure, simply put, uh, is an analog of the boiling point, right? If I have a liquid hanging out with me, like water, uh, just here in my room, uh, if I raise the temperature of my of the room of the of the ambient temperature around me to 100 degrees Celsius, well, one, I'll be very uncomfortable, but two, my water will boil. We know that because that's what we call the boiling point of water, right? So if I have a cup of water, right, and there's a cup of water here hanging out with me at 25 degrees Celsius. I won't see much of a change. I mean, there'll be some vaporization due to the fact, due to molecular uh, motion. But uh, it, I have, I am not reaching my boiling point. I'm not boiling this thing, right? If I'm changing the temperature around the ambient temperature around to 100 degrees Celsius, then this thing will start boiling, and it will become uh, vaporized, and I'll get, I'll get water vapor, right? That's, that's, we know that. That's the boiling point. Okay, cool. Uh, in case you're confused about vapor pressure, I, I don't know why it's not uh, mentioned uh, this way, or maybe it is. I, I know when I studied it, it was never mentioned this way. I and mean, if someone mentioned it this way, I would have understood it right away. It took me a while to get this. So if I have water hanging out with me at 1 atm, which is very nice to pressure to be around, and then I brought the pressure up. I don't know what the vapor, what the, the vapor pressure for water is. I just, I don't know. But if I increase this pressure, my ambient pressure, which is not as easy to do as increasing the temperature. This is, you know, I just I heat things up. I get a heater or something. This is not as easy to do. I have to squeeze the room around me or something. But if I'm changing the, the pressure around me up to a certain value, I don't know what that is. I increase that tremendously to a, to, a, to a much higher value. I will reach a point where this starts boiling. The point at which this starts boiling, that, that value, which I don't remember what it is right now, at, you know, that ATM value, that is my uh, vapor pressure. So it's very much the same as a boiling point. It's like the boiling pressure, if you will. Anyway, going back to our original, uh, original quest here. What I'm asserting to you here, right, is that if I take the pressure at which this thing will boil anyway, right, the pressure at which my, my say, water will, will boil, whatever that number is, I don't remember, and I divide that by the total pressure, I will reach uh, my, I, I will get my partial pressure, right? I have a partial pressure uh, for, for my species. If that, that value, once this value is reached, Obviously, I started vaporizing this thing, and I have enough vapor above my mixture. Uh, once I reach that value, I have enough of it to burn. That's all I'm trying to say. So below this value, I don't have enough vapor vaporization from the liquid below to be meaningful to burn. So my, my lower limit hasn't been reached yet. So that's what I'm trying to say. So uh, let's look at uh, examples. We'll look at two examples, one with a pure substance and one with a mixture. And I think it will make a lot more sense when you see that uh, in being used as an example. So example one will be a pure substance for methanol. And I want you to, to calculate the flash point. What is the flash point for methanol? Uh, and I'm telling you it's at 760 uh, tor and that it has a lower flammability limit of 6.7%. Okay, so I'm telling you, I, I looked this up for you and this is occurring at room pressure, at room pressure, uh, at standard conditions. Uh, and I will also say that in order for you to calculate the vapor pressure for methanol, you can use an empirical formula known as the Antoine equation, which I'm, I know for a fact you've seen before. Uh, and it will be uh, this. OK. 
okay, where uh, A is a certain value and B is a certain value and C is a certain value, which again, these things, you can go and look them up as well. Um, and they have certain forms depending on the source you're looking. So the source I specifically looked at uh, had it in the units that I'm, uh, that I'm denoting in the equation. So I will get the pressure in Tor and uh, the temperature in degrees Celsius. So if I put Kelvin, it won't work. If I'm trying to get this in ATM, it won't work. So I have to use this. These values will spit out these units. Different values will spit out different units. So uh, that's, that's, I think, all you will need. So let's go, let's look at it. Uh, we know that the, to reach the, the flash point, this is the condition we will need to satisfy. We will need to get the, set, the vapor pressure over the total pressure, uh, divide them, and that should be the, uh, close to the LFL. So uh, let me make this into an equal sign because that's going to be my lower flammability limit. I know my LFL, I'm giving it to you as 6.7%. So uh, that's going to be my mole fraction here, 0 0.067. And I know my total pressure, uh, I already told you it's 760 Tor. So why won't I use that to calculate PSAT? And so I get that the vapor pressure, PSAT, PVAP, PSAT, VVAP, same thing. Uh, if I, if I uh, solve for that, uh, I get that this is 50.9 Tor. Did I mention same thing as PVAP? I have students asking me all the time, what's the difference between this and this? There is no difference between this and this. Same thing. Okay, so the PVAP, PSAT, PVAP, PSAT is 50.9 Tor. And now I am equipped with figuring out what the temperature is because the flash point I want in, the in, in temperature. So I'm going to use the Antoine equation from above to calculate my temperature. So this is my PVAP. This thing calculates PVAP, right? So I could say the log of 50.9 is going to equal to A minus B over T plus C, and I have ABC, and the only thing is missing is T, I can solve for T. So basically, I'll substitute that into the Antoine equation, and it's going to be the log of 50.9 Tor uh, is going to be equal to the A, which is 8.08097, minus the B, which is 1582.271, divided by the temperature that I want, plus C, which is 239.729. And when you solve for temperature, you get that the temperature is 8.51 degrees Celsius, okay? And I will just let you know that uh, literature says it's around 11.1 .1 degrees Celsius, literature. So, you know, not so far, but, you know, it gives you, it gives you a, uh, a nice good estimate for what that is. Because, you know, I'm, uh, we're assuming that it's an idea, uh, idealized uh, substance here. Uh, and that the, the, uh, we're, we're assuming that Antoine works, which it doesn't necessarily work. It's just an empirical formula. Okay, and it has its, its own limitation. So that's how you would do it for a pure substance. Uh, and I think it's pretty simple, I think, at this point, right? You just have to kind of mess around with the Antoine or whatever your source is for the vapor pressure to figure the, the temperature at which things will, will burn. Okay. Let's look now at a mixture which is slightly more uh, involved. So, uh, mixture. Example tool be a mixture. So, I'm going to use a binary mixture, but it's the same for any of them. Okay. And so I have a 50 50, uh, 50 mole percent uh, acetone methanol. So each one will be 50. So this is X, it's in the liquid. And I'm going to use this to disinfect vials in a clean room. Okay? And I know that the clean room uh, uh, kept at five degrees Celsius. My clean room is kept at five degrees Celsius, but now uh, construction is going to occur in my clean room. Uh, they need to do something, maybe uh, switch a hood or something. Uh, and uh, they're going to have to use some open flame for this. So should that be of concern? So basically calculate uh, the, the, calculate the flash point for this. 
Okay, and so uh, you will actually need to do three things to do that. So I need to calculate the flash point, and I'll give you more. Well, let me give you some more data here. You uh, need to know again that it, to calculate the PVAP, which is PSAP, which is PVAP, which is P. Please don't ask me ever, ever what the difference is. Uh, a minus B over T plus C again. Uh, I'm going to give you the Antoine for uh, for methanol and acetone. Okay, so if I have acetone and methanol, uh, and I'll give you the ABCs for it. So you know you you're given all this stuff. Uh, a is so it's a little bit. Uh, involved here, but you, you will need to do se several things before you get to the flash point because you don't know uh, the LFL for this. So uh, B is 1566. So bear with me if I could have had this automated, I would have. Sorry, uh, 1582.27. C is 273. And 239.7 B. Okay, and uh, LFL at 5 degrees Celsius. Okay, uh, is 2.5 percent here and 6.3 percent here. Okay, so you will need that. Okay, so I, I gave you the ABC, the LFL. You can apply this to get the vapor pressure. Okay, so in order for me to do all of this, <coughs> let's look. Uh, the flash point condition again, the flash point condition for me is going to be uh, LFL is, uh, we're going to do the, the, for the mixture, it's going to be equal to the vapor pressure for the mixture divided by the total pressure for the mixture. Okay, so we need that. Now, do we know the vapor pre the LFL for the mixture? No, we know the the LFL for the each individual uh, species. So in order for us to get the LFL for the mixture, I'll remind you we had a relation for that. We need to get that from uh, the vapor pressure. Sorry, from the vapor composition of the mixture. And so the LFL for a mixture, as a, as a reminder, is going to be one over the sum of over all species of their mole fractions divided by their individual LFL I's. So we know the LFL I's, I gave it to you here, but we don't know the mole fraction of the vapor. We know the mole fraction of the liquid. We know it's 50-50, but we don't know what it is in the vapor state. So what can we use? Well, let's assume an ideal gas, an ideal mixture. So if we use an ideal mixture, we can say that uh, that Raoul's law is going to apply. And so Raoul's law, bet you thought you'd never see him again, but here he is. Raoul's law is back. So Raoul's law says uh, pretty much this. Uh, and again, this is this is only going to work for uh, an ideal mixture. Uh, you, you know, you have to correct for it with with other factors if it's not ideal. Okay, so that's true. Great. <coughs> what we'll do is uh, well, we need the vapor pressure for the individual species. So now, rather than bore you around with this, I basically went in here and literally plugged in uh, at five degrees Celsius I put in a B and C for for acetone and at five degrees Celsius I put ABC for methanol and when I do that I get that P this is just from the Antoine P vape for methanol uh, is 41.3 and P uh, sat for acetone, or just A, is 100.1 torr. Okay. All right. So uh, what do we know from the Rolls law? That I can just, I can add the two components together to get the total pressure. So P total 
is going to be equal to, uh, well, what? It's going to be equal to the P vape uh, of methanol times X methanol plus the P vape of acetone times X acetone. So I know this is 50%, 50%. So I can, I can add them up. Uh, and I get that this is 71.1 torr, right? I also know that uh, this thing here from my Raoult's law definition, this is going to be my, my partial pressure for acetone, and it's going to be my partial pressure for methanol, right? And so, and I also know that Y... I is equal to PI divided by P total. So my Y methanol is going to be equal to, well, my P methanol, which is my P vape times my XM, so 40.5 times 41.3 tor divided by 71.1 torr and I get that uh, this uh, my Y methanol is 0.3 I could do the same thing for the Y acetone or I can do 1 minus this and I get that my Y acetone is 0.7 because they have to add up to 1 so that's how we get the uh, the composition in the vapor so let's go back here now are we good to go well, almost, we need to get the LFL for the mixture. Let's go back here. We need to apply this condition to find the temperature at which, uh, at which uh, we'll, you will see flash point, a flash point occur. So, to do this, we need the LFL for the mixture. To get the LFL for the mixture, we need this. We have all of this. Look at that. So, it will be 1 over, I have two components. Y methanol divided by LFL methanol by the LFL methanol plus Y acetone divided by the LFL of acetone. We have all of that now. We know that this is 0.3 and this is 0.7. And we, we're given this in the table. So that's pretty cool. So now we can do it. So I will just put it all in. And note, I'm going to keep the... Uh, the y's as mole fractions and i'm going to keep the lfl's as percent why not i can do that mathematically i can do that so uh this is 6.3 uh this is uh, 0.7 and this is 2.5 and when i add that all up i get that i don't need this anymore my lfl for the mixture Uh, is going to be 3.0 percent. Okay, so now I found my LFL for the mixture, and you can see right here I can't just I can't just average them. I can just take a look at average. It's not going to give me exactly the same thing. I have to use this this relation, this thing, to get my LFL for the mixture. Okay, cool. So now I have my LFL for the mixture, which was really the hard part in the mix in in this question. Now it's the same as the question before. I have my LFL for the mixture. Cool. Uh, I know my P total now. I calculated it. Well, sorry, I didn't calculate it. That's 760. And now I need to calculate my P saturation. So uh, basically, it's the same as before. If I multiply that, I get that my P vape for the mixture is 3.0% uh, times 760 torr. Uh, and that's 23 torr. I also know that my P vape for the mixture, this thing, uh, is going to be equal to, uh, well, I have half-half. I have 50-50. So 50% 50 of this comes from methanol and 50% of this comes from, uh, from acetone. So I'll have 0.5 times P uh, vape of methanol plus 0.5 times P vape of acetone and that should give me 23 torr that's this is what i'm going to have to work with now now this is not calculable at the moment because i'm looking for the temperature so use 
to find temperature, just so we do meth methanol by itself. So I'm going to basically put the, uh, the equations back in here. So I have these two relations. I have the Antoine's here. So I have log is equal to A minus B over T plus C. So I can solve for P vape for each one of them. So let me try to show you what the equation you'll need to work with, the full-blown equation you'll need to work with. And I will remind you that the Antoine is itself just an empirical observation. It's not, uh, not gospel. It's just an approximation. But I can solve this for P vape by uh, taking 10 to the for each side. And I get that uh, 0.5 times 10 raised to the this is going to be a little bit uh, unruly, but bear with me. 10 raised to the uh, 7.6313 minus the B, 1566.69, divided by the temperature, which I don't know, which would be in Celsius, plus 273.419. Okay? This plus. The, the other guy, 0.5 times 10 raised to the, uh, it's A, which was 8.08097, minus the B, which is 1582.27, divided by T, plus 239.73, okay? I don't know the temperature. Okay, so now, this whole thing has to equal 23. This is my equation in tor. This has to be equal to 23 tor. Uh, I don't know the temperature. And it's the same temperature here and here. So I have one equation, one unknown, but I cannot explicitly solve for temperature here. Uh, or if I, I don't think I can, I doubt it. And uh, what I did myself, I, I just went to a, to a window in Excel and I just... Uh, Messed around, uh, did, did some uh, approximations, and I was able to find, uh, based on trial and error, that the temperature for this equation to occur is around negative 15.5 degrees Celsius. Okay, so what this means is that the flash point, if you go back to the original question, the flash point for this mixture is negative 15.5 degrees Celsius. Anything higher than this. Uh, if you have an open flame, you may uh, reach combustion state. And I will remind you, this thing is kept at 5 degrees Celsius. Uh, it's not cold enough. So, no, do not use open flame uh, for the construction of your, uh, of your clean room. So that's not good. Uh, I hope this makes sense. Uh, this kind of put everything into use. Uh, I will just remind you, when, we, when you're doing this, try to keep the LFLs in percent and try to keep the mole fractions in fractions for this to work uh, for these relations to work otherwise they won't uh, the LFL for the mixture I mean uh, to get the LFL of the mixture from the components oh well thank you